Good morning. In the last two lectures, we have been discussing Young's double slit experiment. Young's double slit experiment works uh, using the principle of division of wave front. This is something which we had not discussed in the last two classes. So, let me uh, briefly tell you what this is all about. The two slits which are used in the Young's double slit experiment divides the wave fronts which come from this source, it divides the wave front into two, one from the upper part and uh, one upper part and the lower part. So, it is these so, it is these two wave fronts which we obtain by dividing a single wave front which are made to interfere on the screen over here and it is this which produces the interference pattern. It is necessary to adopt this kind of a technique because usually two different sources, if I had two different point sources over here, they would be incoherent. That is the waves that emanated from one point source would not interfere with the waves that emanate from another point source. So, to overcome this problem that is to produce two sources which are coherent, we have to adopt different techniques. So, the technique used here is division of wave front, the same wave, same wave front is divided using the two slits and then they, the two wave fronts are produced are superposed to produce the interference pattern. Now, today we shall discuss something else, we shall discuss another very interesting situation, another very interesting apparatus which can be used to study interference and this is called the Michelson interferometer. The Michelson interferometer works by uh, using a different technique, it uses division of amplitude and not division of wave front. So, let us discuss how what the Michelson interferometer apparatus looks like and how it works. So, this shows you schematically the Michelson interferometer. You have a light source which illuminates a ground glass plate. The ground glass plate has the property that it scatters the incident light into all directions. So, this is an extended source, each point over here is a dis different source, it is an extended source and each point over here emits radiation in all directions. The radiation which is scattered forward, so this is what we are going to focus on. So, the radiation that is scattered forward going in this direction is incident on a beam splitter B. So, the so, the element B over here, the optical element B is a beam splitter. The beam splitter is essentially a slab of glass, one of whose surfaces is semi-silvered. So, it has been given a very thin silver coating. So, in this particular case, the, the lower surface of this glass slab, the lower surface has been given a very thin silver coating so as to increase the reflectivity of the lower surface. So, the lower surface of the beam splitter of this glass slab over here has a very high reflectivity. So, the light which is incident on this and the beam splitter is kept at 45 degrees angle to the direction from which the light is incident from the ground glass plate. So, it is this angle over here is 45 degrees. So, the beam splitter splits the incident wave front, the amplitude of the <coughs> it splits the incident wave front, the whole entire wave front is split into two parts. So, the amplitude of the wave front is divided, one propagating this way the, which is the reflected part, the reflected wave propagating upwards and the transmitted wave shown in blue. So, the reflect, reflected wave is shown in red propagating upwards and the transmitted one shown in blue propagating straight through. 
So the amplitude of the incident wave is now divided into two parts. So the, you have two parts which together whose sum, so the, elect, the sum of the electric field of this wave and this wave is equal to the incident electric field. So the amplitude over here is divided one and there are two waves now which come out from the single wave, one going up and one passing through. Now the wave which goes, which passes through the shown in blue propagates to a mirror. So there is a mirror over here which reflects this wave back which is what is shown in green over here and then the reflected wave again encounters the beam splitter and we are interested in the part of the wave that gets reflected from the bottom of the green beam splitter. The bottom is semi-silvered, it is highly reflective. So a part of the wave trans is transmitted through the beam splitter comes from the ground glass plate, is transmitted through the beam splitter, propagates to this mirror. There is another component C here which I shall come to later. So we are interested in the wave that is transmitted through, comes to this mirror, is reflected and then comes over here and is collected. This light is incident on a telescope which focuses, focuses it to the focus. Now the other wave which is reflected from the beam splitter, so there were two waves produced at the beam splitter, one which was transmitted and one which was reflected. The wave which is reflected at the beam splitter goes up and encounters a mirror which reflects it back, which is shown over here. And then <coughs> it is, a part of it is transmitted through the beam splitter and this again is collected by the telescope. Now. <coughs> The net, the net effect of this apparatus is that you see one, the, the light which goes through this, this and then comes here produces an image of the ground glass plate. The image will be produced somewhere over here. The light which goes through and then comes here and is reflected here produces another image of the ground, of the ground glass plate which is also produced somewhere over here. The two images will be at different locations. Okay, so let me go over this point again. The net effect of this Michelson interferometer is that you will get two images of the ground glass plate. Both of them will be located in the direction of view. So they will be both located in this direction. They will be located somewhere above this mirror, behind this mirror M2 and the distances to these two images of the ground glass plate will depend on the length of these arms of these two arms. So the effective arrangement is again shown over here, the effective, arrange, the effective arrangement is shown over here, the thing which I was just discussing. So you have two images of the ground glass plate which are produced in the direction of the line of sight, which they are produced in this direction. So they are, they, there will be two images of the ground glass plate produced in this direction, which if I put my eye here at the eyepiece of the telescope, I will see two images of the ground glass plate, one arising from the light which is transmitted comes here and is reflected, another arising from the light which is reflected and then transmitted. So one produced by M1, another produced by M2. And <coughs> these two images of the ground glass plate are shown over here. These two images will not in general coincide and if, if the difference in these arm lengths, if the difference in these arm lengths is d, so if one of the arm lengths is at a distance L1 from the beam splitter and the other arm length is at a distance L2 from the beam splitter, then the difference in distance we will call D. So 
if L2 is larger than L2 minus L1, I will refer to as D. So, let me remind you again what L2 and L1 are. L2 is the length of this arm over here. Let me just change the nomenclature. Let me call this L1. Let me call this M2. So, L1 is the length of the arm to the mirror M1 from the beam splitter to the mirror M1. L2 is the length of the arm from the beam splitter to the mirror, mirror M2. We assume that L2 is larger for it does not make a difference which one you assume to be larger. If you assume that L2 is larger, <coughs> then L2 minus L1 we will call D. D is the difference in the arm lengths. The point to remember is D is the difference in the arm lengths. If the two arms have exactly the same length, the difference D will be 0. If one of them is longer, then D is the difference in the lengths, arm lengths. So, <coughs> the two images which are produced by this apparatus will be at a separation 2D. If D is the distance, the difference in the arm lengths, then the two images produced are going to be of the ground glass plate are going to be at a separation of 2D. Why it is 2D is uh, should be clear from the following argument. Let me uh, explain to you briefly why it is 2D. If I have a mirror over here, And if I have a source over here at a distance L, then the image is the same distance behind the source. Now, if I move the source a little backwards to increase the distance from the mirror, so if I move the source to a distance L plus D, so this distance is D, then the image is also going to move back by exactly the same amount D. And the total distance now between the source and the image has increased by a factor of by, by an amount 2D. So, if I move the source by a distance D, the separation between the source and the image increases by 2D. It is exactly for the same reason that if the separation, if the difference in the arm length is D, then the difference between the two images of the ground glass plate is 2D. They will be produced at a distance which is 2D apart. Now, there is a point which I should discuss here which I have not uh, mentioned till now. The point is as follows. The light which propagates to M2, the light which is reflected at the beam splitter goes up and then gets reflected down. This light traverses the thickness of the glass slab three times. Three times because the reflection occurs at the bottom of the glass slab. So, when it comes here for the first time, it goes through it once and then it comes out twice, it goes all the way here and then when it comes back once more. So, that makes it three times. Now, let us look at the transmitted wave. The transmitted wave traverses the glass slab only once, goes through, comes here, gets reflected from the bottom surface, does not enter and then comes over here to the telescope. So, the reflected, the one, the wave which goes to M2 traverses the glass slab three times, whereas the wave that goes to M1 and then comes here traverses the glass slab only once. Now, this introduces an extra optical path difference because the refractive index of glass is different than that of air. So, even if these two arm lengths are exactly the same, the optical path traversed by this wave and this wave are going to differ and the difference is going to be exactly two times the path length inside the glass slab. So, this is going to traverse a slightly larger optical path length than this, even if the arm lengths are exactly equal. So, one has to compensate for this and one could uh, think that you could compensate for it by moving the mirror M1 a little behind, so as to introduce that extra path length. But 
it so happens that the refractive index of glass is wavelength dependent. So, you could compensate for the extra path inside glass at a particular wavelength by moving the mirror back, but then the compensation would not be exactly correct at other wavelengths. So, in order to account for this extra optical path length, it is most convenient to introduce a glass slab which is exactly identical to the beam splitter, but which does not have the silver coating. So, this glass slab is called the compensator. So, it is most convenient to compensate for this extra path which this particular wave has to traverse by introducing a compensator over here. So, the compensator is a beam, a glass slab exactly identical to the beam splitter, but it has no silver coating. So, the now the wave which is transmitted goes to M1 and comes back also passes through the glass slab three times once over here and twice over here. So, the optical path through the glass is exactly identical for the wave that goes up that is reflected up and the wave that is transmitted. So, this is achieved through this optical element called the compensator. So, now any difference in the position of the images is only due to differences in the lengths of the two arms and the separation between the two images of the ground glass plate is exactly twice the difference in lengths of the two arms. So, this is the telescope. Now, let us turn our attention to the image. This is the telescope. So, we can for our purposes replace the telescope by a lens and put look at the image of the produced by this lens at the focal plane. So, what is the role of such a lens? The role of such a lens is that it will take all the light coming in a particular direction and focus it to a single point. That is the role of a lens. So, let me <coughs> draw a picture and uh, explain this uh, point to you. The role of the lens is as follows. If there was light coming in this direction, a wave coming in this direction, on the focal plane, the entire wave, so this, this, this is focused to a single point over here. And if the wave is coming at an angle as it is shown over here, if the wave comes at an angle theta, then all of these, all the waves that arrive at this angle are focused to a single point. And if the angle theta is like this upwards, then the point will be below this point over here. If I change theta, the light is going to get focused to a different point. If I increase theta, the light is going to come to a different point over here. If the light propagates this way, if the light propagates in this direction, it is then going to be focused to some point over here. <clears throat> so, this is the role of the lens. Now, let us see what the lens does in this particular situation. In this particular situation, we have two images of exactly the same ground glass plate. Let us look at the image G1 produced by the mirror M1. Every point on this ground glass plate acts like a source. This is an extended source. So, every point over here acts like a source and every point on the ground glass plate sends out light in all directions. Right? That is the property of the ground glass plate it scatters the incident light. The light that comes out from the ground glass plate is scattered in all direction. It comes out in all directions. So, let us <coughs> look at as one point on the ground glass plate, the point S1. So, this is a particular source which is on the ground, a particular point in the ground glass plate which acts like a source S1. So, in S1 is the point on the image G1. Corresponding to this source S1, there will be an image on the ground glass plate G2. So, this point on the ground glass plate over here on this image will have a corresponding 
image in this uh, point in the second image. So, S2 is the source is the image of this point over here is the, on the second image. Okay. Now, <coughs> what the lens over here does is it focuses, it brings together the radiation that is emitted from this point at an angle theta and this point at an angle theta, both of them are combined to a single point. Not only this, also radiation emitted from this point at an angle theta. So, radiation emitted, radiation emitted from this point at angle theta is also focused onto the same point over here. Similarly, radiation from this point at an angle theta is also going to be focused to the same point over here by the lens. So, so radiation from all the points on this image, all the points on this image which are emitted at an angle theta. So, if this angle as long as this angle it makes with the normal is theta, all this all these waves are going to be focused to a single point over here. And at this point you are going to have the superposition of all of these waves. Now, the question is which of this radiation is going to interfere with one another. Here you should remember that different points on the ground glass plate are incoherent sources. So, this, the radiation from this point is not going to interfere with the radiation from this point on the same gra gra uh, ground, same image of the ground glass plate. That is the first point. Second point is that the radiation from here is going to interfere from the radiation with the radiation from its image on the second. So, so, so the radiation from this point and the radiation from this point are going to interfere with each other because they are the images of the same point on the ground glass plate. It is basically the same source. We are seeing two images of the same source. And since these are two different images of the same source, the radiation from here and the radiation from here are going to be coherent. The radiation from here is not going to interfere with the radiation from any other point on the image, neither is it going to interfere with the radiation from any other point on this image. So, it, it will only interfere with radiation from its its own image. So, S, S1 is going to interfere with the radiation from S2, where S1 and S2 are the images of the same point on the ground glass plate. Similarly, the radiation from this point is going to radi uh, interfere with the radiation from its corresponding image on the other, other image over here, from the corresponding point on the other image. Okay. So, we are going to have interference between pairs of waves which originate from two different images of the same point on the ground glass plate. <clears throat> so, what you will get over here is a superposition of two waves, one over here, one from this image and one from this image. And you have to add up the intensity from waves coming from all of such, all such points. So, let us ask the question, what is the intensity pattern on the screen over here going to look like? Right. So, the intensity pattern on the screen over there is going to be a superposition of the of two waves. Remember again, it is going to be a superposition of one wave which originated from this image of the ground glass plate, another wave which originated from this image of the ground glass plate. We will focus on only one point on this image and one point on this image. The waves which are emitted at an angle theta from here and here, both of them are going to be superposed here. So, the resultant electric field at this point over here is the electric field of the wave emitted from here and the wave emitted from here superposed, which is what I show over here. So, this is the wave from the first image, this is the wave from the second image. Both of them will get superposed on that point in the screen. Now, if I wish to calculate the intensity at that point in the screen, so I wish to calculate the intensity at this point arising from this image and this image together. The intensity at that point is I 1 plus I 2 plus 2 root I 1 I 2 
cos phi 2 minus phi 1. We have discussed, we have derived this formula two classes back and we have discussed it. I 1 is the intensity of the light coming from here, I 2 is the intensity of the light coming from here, phi 2 minus phi 1 is the phase difference between these two. And the phase difference between these two waves arises because they have to travel a different path. These two, these two images of the ground glass plate are effectively sources which are separated by a distance 2D and if you are looking at a wave which is emitted at an angle theta, then the path difference between these two is 2D cos theta. So, phi 2 minus phi 1 <coughs> will arise because of this path difference 2D cos theta, you have to multiply it by 2 pi by lambda to get the phase difference between the two waves. Now, there is another contribution, another effect which contributes to the phase difference. This effect is as follows. If you follow the beam, the wave which gets reflected and then comes here, notice that it undergoes an internal reflection it undergoes an internal reflection at this over here because it gets reflected from the interface of the glass and air. Whereas, the transmitted wave undergoes an external reflection because it is reflected at the boundary of air and glass. So, there is a phase difference of pi between internal reflection and external reflection which in so this fact that one of the waves undergoes an internal reflection, another an external reflection introduce an extra phase difference of pi between the two waves and this also has to be included. So, the phase difference between the two waves is pi plus the contribution due to the path difference because the two sources do not, two images do not coincide. So, this is the total phase difference between the two waves. Now, if this is the phase difference, let us ask the question under what condition are we going to get a minima in the intensity. The minima in the intensity is going to occur when the phase difference is pi. So, if the if you want the phase difference over here to be pi then 2 d cos theta should be an integer multiple of the wavelength. So, which is the condition over here. So, this condition if this condition is satisfied where m is an integer, you will have a dark fringe. So, at that particular value of theta, you will get a dark fringe. If you want, if you ask the question under what condition will you get a bright fringe? You will get a bright fringe if 2 d, if phi 2 minus phi 1 is an even multiple of 2 pi, if phi 2 y phi minus phi, if the phase difference is 0, 2 pi, 4 pi, then you will get a bright fringe. If you want the phase difference to be an even multiple of 2 pi, then you get a condition for 2 d cos theta. 2 d cos theta should be equal to m plus half lambda. Right. So, the condition for a bright fringe is that 2 d for a bright fringe, the same thing just that you have to put in a factor of m plus half instead of m. So, this is for a bright and this is for a dark fringe. Further, <coughs> you should note that if the wave from here and the wave from here for this particular source, so there is, we are focusing on one point. So, for this point, the phase difference between its the wave from here and its counterpart on the other image, if the phase difference between these two is such that it cancels out, then it is going to cancel out for every pair of points on these two screens and you will get totally dark point over here. This is the first point, uh, point which you should note. Second point is that this whole apparatus is symmetric around this central axis. So, you could rotate the whole thing around the central axis, you could rotate the whole thing around this and you will get the same condition to hold. 
So, what this tells us is that you will get circular fringes. So, the fringe pattern that you observe on the screen over there or if you put your eyes at the focal uh, at the eyepiece of the telescope or if you put a lens and focus the light onto a screen, what you will observe over there is circular fringe patterns, you will get circular patterns of dark and bright. Okay. So, this is, uh, <coughs> so I have in the first half of this lecture, I have tried to give you an idea of what the Michelson interferometer looks like and how it functions. Let us now uh, go into slightly more detail into the uh, fringe pattern that you expect to see. So, suppose we have adjusted the whole interferometer so that the central fringe at the center of the field of view, you have a dark fringe. Let me remind you once more what we mean by the center of the field of view. Light which is emitted parallel to the axis over here theta equal to 0 would be focused to the center over here or if you were to place your eye at the eyepiece of a telescope which you, which you had over here, then the direction which you see at, at the center of the field of view corresponds to light which is propagated which is emitted over here at theta equal to 0. Increasing theta means larger and larger circles over here and the fringe condition is 2 for a dark fringe is 2 d cos theta is equal to m lambda. So, if you have a dark fringe at the center then as you go out you will find that the you will get it will get brighter and brighter and again it is going to get dark. So, you will get circular fringes like this. Now, let us ask the question what is the condition if you wish to have a dark fringe at the center. So, this is the condition for a dark fringe in the first place, the center corresponds to theta equal to 0. So, if you wish to have a dark fringe at the center, the condition is 2 d should be equal to m lambda. So, twice the difference in the arm lengths should be an integer multiple of the wavelength of the light that you are using for doing the experiment, that is the first thing. So, what we see over here is that in the Michelson interferometer, you will get circular a circular fringe pattern. Then we ask the question, what is the condition that should be satisfied if you want a dark fringe at the center of the field of view? If you want a dark fringe at the center of the field of view, the two arm lengths should be adjusted in such a way, so that twice the difference in the arm length twice d should be an integer multiple of lambda. This will produce a dark fringe at the center because the light which propagates straight down that is at no at uh, along the axis of the interferometer, it will get a phase difference, it will get a path difference which is 2 d as it goes through. So, the phase difference is going to be 2 pi by lambda into 2 d which is going to be an integer multiple of 2 pi. So, you do not expect this to produce the dark uh, the two waves to cancel out. What causes the two waves to cancel out under this condition is the extra phase of pi which is introduced because one wave undergoes internal reflection, the other one undergoes external reflection. So, this is the condition uh, which has to be satisfied if you want a central dark fringe and you can also calculate the order of the fringe the order of the fringe m is 2 d by lambda. So, larger the separation between the two arm lengths, the higher the order of the central dark fringe. <coughs> Next, let us ask the question what is the fringe spacing. So, I have already told you that in the Michelson interferometer experiment, you will get circular fringes. So, suppose we adjust the interferometer in such a way, so we adjust the two arm lengths in such a way, so that the difference is between the two lengths is such that I get a dark spot at the center of the field of view. 
the two waves which arrive from the two arms, the phases exactly cancel out at the center of the field of view. Now, let us ask the question. So, we have a dark spot at the center of the field of view. As I go outwards, I am going to get a bright line around it and then I am going to get the first circular dark ring. Right? So, we have the dark spot at the center, then we have a bright fringe around it and then we have the first circular dark ring. And we would like to calculate the spacing between two dark rings. So, let us calculate these distance of the first dark ring from the center of the central dark spot. So, the central dark fringe occurs at theta equal to 0, it satisfies the condition 2 d is equal to m lambda where m is an integer. Now, when we look at the first dark fringe which is the fringe over here, so we look at the fringe, the first dark fringe. So, we will look at this particular fringe over here and ask the question what is the angular separation between this and this. This corresponds to an order m where m is 2 d by lambda. Now, if I <coughs> let us just go back to the fringe condition this is the fringe condition. So, if I increase theta maintaining the same distance d, if I increase theta going outwards means increasing theta, then cos theta the value of cos theta has to will go down. Cos theta is maximum when theta is 0 at the center. Now, if I increase theta the value of cos theta goes down. So, you can see that the value of m will correspondingly go down. So, for the first the fringe condition for the first fringe tells us that 2 d cos theta is equal to m minus 1 lambda. This is the condition for the first fringe. This is the condition for the central fringe the 0 th the central fringe at theta equal to 0. This is a condition where you will see the first dark fringe. The order of the fringe of this fringe is 1 less than the order of the central fringe. And if you assume that this angle theta is small you can then expand cos theta as 1 approximately 1 minus theta square by 2. There will be higher order terms also which are small if you assume that theta is small which can be dropped. And if you put this in over here, so you will get 2 d. <coughs> so, what you get when you put this in over here is 2 d 1 2 d 1 minus theta square by 2 is equal to m minus 1 lambda. Now, we subtract this from this and what you are left with is theta square is equal to lambda by d which gives you theta is equal to square root of lambda by d. So, the fringe spacing the angular separation between the central dark fringe and the first circular ring theta is the square root of lambda by d. Just recollect that in the Young's double slit experiment the fringe spacing was lambda by d whereas in this situation it is square root of lambda by d. So, let us go back to this expression for the fringe spacing and ask the question what happens if we increase the difference in length between the two arms. So, notice that if you increase d the fringe spacing becomes smaller and smaller. So, the larger the difference in the length of the two arms the closer the fringe pattern is going the fringes are going to get. So, the fringe pattern is going to shrink the fringes are going to be closer and closer and if you make the two arms nearly equal the spacing between the fringes is going to increase. Now, you could ask the question what happens when you make both arms of equal length both arms of equal length corresponds to d equal to 0 right d is the difference in the length of the two arms. So, if both the arms have exactly the same length the uh, 
difference d between the two lengths is going to be 0. What happens in this situation? So, what you see is that in this situation, the entire field of view, the light from the entire field of view is going to cancel, uh, uh, is going to be pi out of phase. So, the entire field of view is going to be dark. So, as you bring the two arm lengths make the two arm lengths nearly equal, the fringe spacing is going to increase, the dark central dark spot is going to get bigger and the first circular fringe is also going to get bigger and the spacing between them is going to increase until finally, when you make both the arm lengths exactly equal, the whole field of the central dark spot is going to fill the entire field of view, which is going to be dark. Okay. So, let me recapitulate what we have learnt over here. If you increase the separation between the two arm lengths, the fringes are going to get closer and closer. If you make the arm lengths very close to each other, the lengths very close to each other, the fringes are going to be far apart. And finally, if you make the arm lengths exactly equal, the whole field of view is going to be covered by the central dark fringe. So, the field of view is going to be dark. Let us move on to another question now. And the next question uh, which we are going to discuss is what happens if I increase d? So, we have adjusted the Michelson interferometer, so that we have uh, a dark spot at the center for a certain value of d. Now, we move one of the mirrors slowly, so as to increase the difference in the length of the two arms. So, by moving one of the mirrors, we slowly increase the value of d the question is what is going to happen. And we shall follow the evolution of a fringe of a particular order as we increase the separation between the two arm lengths. So, at the start we have a certain value of d and for this value of d we will get, we have arranged the apparatus so that we have a dark spot at the center. So, the order of the central dark spot is decided or rather decides the separation in the two arm lengths and to start with the central spot is of order m which is 2 d by lambda. Now, let us follow what happens to this same fringe as I increase d. So, m is fixed it refers to a particular dark fringe. As I increase d, so if you increase d, you want to maintain the same value of m. So, you are starting from theta equal to 0. For theta equal to 0, cos theta is 1. Theta m is the angle of the mth order fringe. It is 0 to start with. Now, you increase d a little bit and ask the question, where is the mth order fringe going to occur? If you increase d, then the value of cos theta has to go down to maintain this equality and cos theta will be reduced if theta increases. So, if you increase the value of d, the value of theta corresponding to the mth order fringe also increases. So, this fringe is going to go out. If you as you increase the separation between the two arm lengths, this fringe is going to get bigger and bigger and you will get another dark fringe at the end at the center. So, as you increase that arm length, this fringe is going to go out and it will move outwards. If you move it out sufficiently, so that you have another dark fringe at the center, this fringe is going to go out. The dark fringe in the center has a is of a larger order, right. D has increased, you are looking at the center, so cos theta is still 1. So, if D has increased and you have a dark fringe at the center, so M should have gone up by 1 and the fringe that you are focusing on of order m has now gone out. It has gone to a larger value of theta. If you continue to increase d, this particular fringe is going to move even further out in the field of view and if you keep on increasing d, this fringe is going to move out of the field of view. So, what you see is that as you increase d, a fringe of a particular order appears at the center and then it moves outwards and finally, it moves out of the field of view. right? So, as you keep on increasing 
D newer and newer higher and higher order fringes appear at the center they move out and then finally go out of the field of view. This is the kind of uh, thing that you will see if you keep on increasing the uh, separation between the two arms newer and newer fringes will appear at the center and they will move out and slowly go out of the field of view. <coughs> Let me now discuss some very interesting uses of the Michelson interferometer. One very interesting application and quite useful application of the Michelson interferometer is to measure the wavelength of light. The visible light as we have learnt it has a wavelength somewhere around 500 to 600 nanometers. This is an extremely small length scale and it is not possible I mean such a small length scale is beyond direct human perception and it is not possible to measure such small length scales using meters or uh, micrometers. So, it is not possible to measure such small length scales of the order of hundreds of nanometers directly using meters which can be controlled by the uh, by the by us straight away. Okay. So, the problem is how do we measure the wavelength of light which we which I have told you is in the range 500 to 600 nanometers. So, the Michelson interferometer gives us a method by which you can measure the wavelength of light. So, suppose we adjust the Michelson interferometer so that there is a dark spot at the center. So, I have adjusted the Michelson interferometer so that there is a dark spot at the center. Now, I have already told you that if I increase the if I increase this difference in the arm length if I increase d by moving one of the mirrors then this particular dark fringe is going to go outwards and a new dark fringe will appear at the center. So, this particular dark fringe now becomes like this bigger and there is a new dark fringe at the center. So, I start the experiment where there is a particular order dark fringe at the center. I do not know what the order is, but there is some order of dark fringe at the dark, there is a dark fringe of some order at the center of my Michelson interferometer. Now, I move one of the mirrors so as to increase d and I count how many new dark, new fringes appear at the center. So, from here to here one new fringe has appeared, here to here two new fringes appeared the fringe which was there earlier at the center has now moved out over here. If I increase the length even further this is going to move out even further and I will get a third. So, here there is one new fringe, two new fringes I will get a third new fringe if I keep on increasing d I will get more and more new fringes. So, suppose I start with a particular d so that I have a certain order of fringes which I do not know to start with which I do not know, but I increase d and I count how many new fringes appear at the center and I keep on increasing d until 1000 new fringes appear at the center. So, this will require a bit of patience you have to keep on moving the mirror and counting how many and count how many new fringes appear at the center 1000 requires quite a bit of patience. Students in our laboratory typically go for 100 fringes. So, this experiment is there in our uh, third year physics laboratory not in the first year not in this particular course, but advanced physics students do it. There they do not go all the way to 1000 they sit look through the eyepiece move one of the mirrors and count the number of fringes new fringes that appear and they go till somewhere like 100, but 1000 will give you more accurate result. So, you move one of the mirrors count how many new fringes appear in the field of view keep on moving the mirror until 1000 new fringes have appeared in the field of view. So, after 1000 fringes have appeared this is the condition that will be satisfied. So, you would have moved the mirror one of the mirrors by a distance delta d and 1000 new fringes have appeared. So, you are going to have m plus 1000. So, you started with this 
and after 1000 new fringes have appeared, you are going to have this. Now, you could subtract these two, you will get a relation that delta d is equal to 500 times lambda. Now, how much is delta d? Let us estimate this. <coughs> so, delta d is of the order of 500 times the wavelength of light which is somewhere in the range of 600 nanometers 500 to 600 nanometers. So, this is of the order of 3 into 10 to the power 3 into 10 to the uh, 30 sorry 10 to the power 4 into 10 to the power minus 9 meters that is a nanometer which is equal to 30 micrometers, micrometer is 10 to the power 6. Right? 10 to the power 4, so 10 to the power 500, so that is 10 to the power, oh 6, so you will get 10 to the power 5 here, not 4. Right? 1, 2, uh, 1, this should be 500. 1, 2, 3, 4 zeros and 30 gives you one more 5 zeros. So, 10 to the power 5 into 10 to the power 9. So, you will get 3 into 10 to the power minus 4 meters, which is 0.3 millimeters, which you can measure without great difficulty. So, delta D for 1000 new fringes at the center. delta d is of the order of 0.3 millimeters. If you have 100 new fringes, delta d is of the order of 0 0.03 millimeters, which is uh, 30 micrometers both of these can be measured using a micrometer screw gauge. So, you can measure you can measure the distance you have to move one of the mirrors in order to produce 1000 new fringes or you could measure the distance you have to move the mirrors one of the mirrors to introduce 100 new fringes. And once you can if you can measure this you can determine the value of the wavelength of light lambda. So, delta D is of the order of 500 lambda if you have 1000 new fringes. So, even though lambda is extremely small, 500 lambda is not so small, you can measure it using a micrometer and such measurements uh, can be used to determine the wavelength of light. Okay. So, <coughs> in Today's lecture, uh, we have learned about the Michelson interferometer. The Michelson interferometer achieves interference through the division of amplitude. The same wave is divided into two waves of lesser amplitude and these are sent to through two different paths and then made to interfere. This interferometer produces circular fringes and the fringe condition, the condition for there to be a fringe is 2 d cos theta should be equal to m lambda. Theta is the angle with the line of sight to the center. So, this angle over here is theta. So, this is the line of sight. Theta is the angle over here and the condition for a dark fringe is 2 d cos theta should be equal to m lambda. This will give you a dark fringe of order m at an angle theta m. For a bright fringe, you can you have to replace this by m plus half. And we have studied various properties of this fringe pattern, the fringe spacing, how the fringe pattern evolves if you increase the distance between the two mirrors. And then we studied one application of the Michelson interferometer, 
we studied how you can use the Michelson interferometer to measure the wavelength of light. In the next lecture, we shall continue our discussion of the Michelson interferometer.